<laughs> thank you guys very much. Thank you guys very much for joining us today. On behalf of the David Hoffman Group, I want to say welcome and thank you for uh, being with us. Um, as you guys know, David is uh, um, David's very well known as one of the top agents in Charlotte. Uh, owns one of the top teams in Charlotte. Now one of the top. All right. So one of these days, Catherine's going to stop. So I appreciate <laughs> Catherine. We all love you. Um, so we're going to get started. Sorry, I hate to interrupt. <laughs> Um, so we're going to start. Is, can we start? Well, I wanted to tell people about your economic background. Okay. Real fast. I'll make it fast. So hello. For those, for those of you who don't know, uh, David's actually got a degree in economics. Um, his work has been featured in several textbooks that are currently in use. And his, uh, he's also been featured in the Wall Street Journal for his economic work. So I want you guys to take notes today, be really involved here. Um, this is not gonna be just some high level, high flying, uh, quick talk. This is gonna go really deep into the nuts and bolts of what's gonna happen in our economy and the why. So we're so fortunate to have this opportunity today. So David, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Catherine. Good morning, gang. Um, so I hope everyone's having a good start today. I was saying to Catherine that I hope that everyone takes notes. And I don't always say that, but the reason I say that is not because you're going to hear like all these amazing nuggets. I hope you do take away one or two. Um, but what I'd like for you to do, guys, is I'm just going to put all the information out there and show you what history has said about this information, about this data, um, and then you know, with your notes, please ask questions, put them in the chat, like raise your hands, whatever works for you. Um, I'd like for you to help unpack for yourself and for your family and clients what that means. And so what I'll say to Catherine right before we get started is, you know, we don't want to tell people now's the time to sell the house. Now it's time to buy a house. That's why no one trusts realtors, right? It's because we get compensated when someone buys a home. We get compensated when someone sells a home. You might say we shouldn't sell right now you might say we shouldn't buy right now and that's actually a good thing if that's what is best but we really shouldn't say anything guys we shouldn't tell our clients and our family anything we should just give them all the facts and ask questions to let them make the best decision because they're all adults you might be the experts but they're adults and they need to make the best decision for them and their family and so what i want to do is i want to one start from a macro level about the economy talk about, um, you know, have we been in a recession? Are we going to a recession? Talk about the stock market, talk about in interest rates and inflation, just overall macroeconomics, talk about funds and what's going to happen to the dollar, and then bring that down to a micro level, both for the Carolinas as well as for real estate, okay? And so I put in our local close page for anyone in our gang this morning that, you know, what if I told you we already had a recession? And some of you may know that. I'm just going to jump in, guys. So some of you may know that. Some of you may not. The media hasn't really picked it up too much because we had two very pressing issues this year. We had the presidential election and we had the pandemic. We also have had so much racial divide. So really three big, three big, um, big challenges this year um, with a lot of strife. And so the recession kind of just came and went, guys. If you don't know, everyone talks about a recession as like a collapse or like a depression, like the world coming to an end. But a recession, all it is in the U.S. is two straight quarters of negative GDP. So in the first quarter, we had negative GDP. And, the, and it was a normal amount, you know, like 5%. The second quarter, we had a tremendous amount of negative GDP. And that was driven by the pandemic. The third quarter, we bounced back. And just like in the second quarter, the second quarter went down too far. The third quarter came back too high, right? So, so um, on one hand, you know, the, the, the second quarter going down so far um, probably wasn't all due to the president. The third quarter coming up so far is because of the president. Neither one was anything to do with our economic cycle. Both the down and the up were just in the 30%, guys, like 32 and 33% respectively, just too great. But that second quarter of negative led to a recession. So the first second quarter, we had, we had two straight negative GDP quarters, which meant that we were actually in a recession. Now, you don't read a lot about that. If you do a deep dive or talk to an economist, that's, you know, I was an economist for a few years in my prior life. They'll say, yeah, we were in a recession. Um, and so what does that mean? What does that mean that we were in a recession? Now, again, the third quarter, we bounced back and we had huge growth in GDP, gross domestic product. So we got out of the recession fast. 
We're going to talk about a double recession in a moment. But what does that mean that we were in a recession? Well, on the front end, I don't think people realize that we were in a recession. Like, I'm, I haven't heard a lot about it. We've talked about it a little bit, but you don't hear the media talking about it. You don't hear the consumer talking about it. No one says, I'm not going to buy stocks because we're in a recession. No one says, I'm not going to buy houses because we're in a recession. But they're not buying cars. You know, the, the Fed, the 10-year Treasury rate was at an all-time low. I see Scott here. Good morning, my friend. I see so many of my friends this morning. Um, and we were talking uh, a couple weeks ago about the 10-year rate. And guys, July 31st, the 10-year Treasury rate was at a 234-year low. And when rates are low, regardless if it's a Treasury rate or if it's the mortgage rate, why are rates low? Why, when you go to buy a car, do they say 0% financing? If everyone wants that car, financing would be 10%, right? If everyone wants the house, financing would be 8%, not 2 right? So I want you guys to see that back in July, when the 10-year rate was at a 234-year low, going back to George Washington, it was because we were in a recession and no one realized. It was because demand was at an all-time low and no one wanted cars. No one was financing furniture. No one was taking vacations. No one's taking out credit cards. It was 9-11 times 10 where everyone was just kind of contracting and saving and consolidating. We had unemployment going through the roof. I want to kind of unpack what happened this year so you can see what happened and where we're going. So the Treasury was at a 234-year low because demand was non-existent, guys. At the end of the summer, demand was non-existent. And you guys might be thinking, that's crazy because I'm in real estate, I'm in mortgage, and like demand is through the roof. And you guys have heard me say this before, guys, demand is not through the roof. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to talk in a few minutes about the pandemic piece. The pandemic piece throws a monkey wrench in all of this, guys, because the pandemic piece says buy the big expensive house because you need an extra room for the home office. Buy the big expensive house because you need an extra room for the home school. Buy the big expensive house with the big backyard and pay 200000 extra for the $80,000 pool, right? Everyone is buying bigger and bigger houses, which is not how the last 10 years of the national real estate market has looked. For any of y'all that have been real estate for a while, and we have a lot of experts on this call, people have been downsizing. People have been consolidating. People have been buying small houses. People have been moving closer in. They've been wanting walkability. They've been using the neighbor gyms and and YMCA's and country clubs are becoming more popular. People have been buying homes with more rooms and less space to consolidate um, utilities and to bring them down. And now everyone's going against that. So kind of hold that for a second. Why is that happening? Why is no one buying the condo uptown, but everyone's buying the big house in our way? It's because of the pandemic. Everyone says it's because the housing market is just soaring because of the pandemic. So just kind of hold that for a second. My question, my first question for you guys is, did you know we already had a recession? Hold that constant. My second question is, regardless if you say yes or no, is the housing market really high because everyone wants a home or is the housing market really high and really weird because of a pandemic that no one's ever seen before? And so my first fact for you is we had a recession this year. The second fact for you was, Everyone wants the big house an hour away. No one wants the penthouse condo in Uptown. Everyone wants the big expensive pool in their backyard. No one wants the beautifully updated condensed home in 0.18 acres in Elizabeth because they want space, guys. People are scared. They want to stretch out. They need to homeschool, home church, homework. They can't vacation. So, all right. So just a little bit about the recession, a little bit of housing. Let's go back to the economy. So we had a recession, guys, 100%. We had a recession in, in the first two quarters. What does that mean for the economy? Well, the good news is the housing market actually goes up six out of 10 times, two out of three times in a recession. And this year was no different. The housing market seemed to have gone up. But if the housing market keeps going up during recessions, it eventually has to go down, right? So just kind of hold that constant. What else happens in a recession? Well, in a recession, people lose their jobs. Yeah, all-time high unemployment this year. In a recession, people's businesses are shut down. Well, yeah, it was shut down because one, um, they couldn't keep it open from a lack of demand. Two, because of the pandemic. Guys, we had a recession. Right, wrong, or indifferent, we had a recession. The good news is 
we need a recession every seven to 10 years. The bad news is no one recognized the recession. See, if the pandemic didn't exist and we had a recession this year, we'd be out of it. And we'd be like, that was great. No one really like felt the big effect of the recession. The stock market felt it in March because we'll talk in a moment why the stock market crashed in March, by the way, because it went down. We had the two biggest days ever this March. Not in the Great Depression, 1929, Nat Block, Monday. Like the, the two worst days of the stock market of all time are this March. No one saw it coming. No one was prepared for it. The richest people in the world, the billionaires, their cash stayed on the sidelines before and after that. I don't know if you guys know that, but um, um, a lot of them bought in too late because they never saw it coming because no one saw the recession coming. But we really should have because it's been 10 years since we had a recession. It's been almost 11 years since we had a recession. Guys, a recession happens every seven years. So this year, a recession was coming. You heard me talk about it last year. We talked about it. Glenn and I were talking about how the housing market go up so high this year. Well, the recession happened, Glenn. We just um, now, you know, I had to wait a couple quarters to show the proof. But the challenge is the housing market doesn't always have a direct relationship to the recession. And so you might not see it. So we're not talking about houses yet, guys. For you and your family, for your spouses, your husbands, your wives, your kids, your parents, anyone in your life, forget about your clients for a moment. You need to know we had a recession. So we need to unpack what that means. And what that means is there's people that don't have jobs. What that means is people are not buying goods. And I gave you another fact. The 10-year rate was at an all-time low. That means people are not buying. Mortgage rates are an all-time low. We got the number one loan officer on earth here. Good morning, Teresa, my friend. Um, if rates are really low, guys, it means demand's not as high as we think it is. When the refi boom was happening in the summer, uh, Teresa was the first one to share because I heard it from her first. You know, they, they raised rates to depress demand a little bit, right? So, so if demand is really high, the rates go up, just like prices. Rates and prices are the same thing. Does that make sense? So when rates are low, it doesn't mean everyone wants a car. It doesn't mean everyone wants a loan. It means rates are low because no one wants a car. It, prices are low when the demand is low, not high. So I want you to see what is happening behind the scenes and may not hit the papers just yet. Um, although we do have Scott in the call. <laughs> um, so going back to the recession again. Well, the good news is the recession was coming. The good news is it happens every seven years. The good news is a recession leads to a buyer's market. The bad news is we're not out of the pandemic yet. The bad news is we don't know how long this is gonna last just yet. You know, the vaccine's coming, that's good. The stock market is really high because of the positivity. You know, Republican or Democrat, uh, people are just happy to see like moving past the election. So certainty, you know, clarity, peace is just so important, guys. Let's stay on the recession for a moment. What does a recession mean for your own family? Forget about your clients for a moment because you have to put the air mask on yourself first. Forget about your clients for a moment because you know what happens in your own house a lot better than you know what happens in their house. So you have to lead by example and understand the economy under your own roof first so you can then share with your clients what you experienced. So, you know, we've had, Teresa has talked about it before. You guys have read about it. Forbearances are coming due. Foreclosures went up tenfold this year, guys. Um, again, just because you're not reading all this just yet doesn't mean it's not happening. It's about to. So anyone who had a forbearance, they couldn't make the mortgage payment in June, July, August, September. Do you think they're making the mortgage payment now? The people that um, were foreclosing in June, July, August, September haven't been kicked out yet, but it's coming. And once they're kicked out, the banks are going to put those homes on the market. So you're going to see a move into the housing market just a little bit on a national level right now. We're still on the macro level, guys. We're still national. We haven't come to Charlotte yet. We're still on the macro level. We talked about the recession, and now we're moving over to real estate a little bit and, and how they all come together. So forbearances are all coming due. That came from the pandemic. Foreclosures have been happening all year, and you might not feel it yet. We're not seeing a lot of foreclosures. We definitely don't see short sales because equity is so high that people don't need to have short sales. But there are foreclosures, guys. There are people that have lots of equity, but unfortunately, they couldn't make their payments and they foreclosed. There are people who have lots of equity, but unfortunately, 
and, and rightfully so, they don't want to move out of their house. So they say, okay, I'll do the forbearance, which is absolutely okay. The challenge is, guys, that the pandemic hasn't gone away. The challenge, guys, is that the economy isn't as strong as it seems. Again, we had this amazing 33% hike in the GDP in the third quarter, but that's only because we had two straight negative GDP quarters of six and 32, which if you add up is 38. Negative 38 is more than positive 32. See where I'm going here, guys? Um, and so you have to see what's not being said just yet. Um, and, and so when you look at all the foreclosures that are happening that haven't come to the courthouse yet in Mecklenburg County and Iredell County and Cabarrus County, and York County, and Lancaster County, and Union County. You haven't seen those yet, but they're coming. But you know they're coming because you saw the defaults. And when you see the forbearances where people didn't make payment, and didn't make payment, and didn't make payment, guys, I don't know about you, but like I can't just like hope for my money and see it. And so all these people that, all these families, I have friends that have, have done forbearances, their money's not any better off today. Now don't get me wrong, if you know someone, now I'm going to the weeds of real estate for a moment. Macro economy, starting with the recession, moving over to housing market. And then we come down to the weeds on a micro level, both for Charlotte and then for how we can help and what it means for our family. You can reach out to your loved ones and ask them if they've done a forbearance. You can reach out to your loved ones and ask them if they're defaulting and see what their housing situation looks like. They might have more equity than they think. And maybe if they haven't done a forbearance, they just pull out cash and do a refi and protect their house, or if they have to sell, they have to sell, but don't let them foreclose. But we're still talking about macroeconomics. People have foreclosed, guys. There's people in the Charlotte area that have foreclosed in the millions. Two to four million a month have foreclosed in the nation, which means 10 to 20,000 people a month are foreclosing in our backyards, if not higher. Um, and, and those homes have to hit the market. So let's talk about real estate for a second. Hold everything we've talked about with the economy so far up here. Let's talk about real estate. We're going to keep going back and forth until we condense this into the crystal ball with the facts that we have. So we've talked a lot about how every January, more homes hit the market. Every February after Super Bowl, more homes hit the market. Every March by St. Patrick's Day, more homes hit the market. And by May, every buyer is out and the market is booming, right? But what happened in 2020? Those homes didn't hit the market in January or February and March. They all came on the market in April, May, June, but the April, May, June homes came on the market in July, August, September. And the July, August, September homes never hit the market because there was, there was the backlog. And so we're, we're behind, guys. We're behind from what we talked about with the economy and we're behind what we talked about the housing market because of the pandemic. And so what's going to happen in 2021 with the housing market? Well, forget about the crystal ball for a moment. Forget about if our clients sell. There is going to be foreclosures that we've not seen in 10, 12 years. There's going to be foreclosures that hit the market and they'll sell fast, but they're going to bring prices down. There's going to be foreclosures that hit the market and they'll be priced high, but it's just more supply. And there's going to be people that in 2020 were going to sell and you know them and I know them and they didn't sell. And I know you're going to get sick of hearing this, but because of the pandemic, right? People hung tight. They laid low. They needed their safe haven. The kids are homeschooling. They're working from home. The last thing they want to do is let contractors in their house. The last thing they want to do is go look for a new house. The last thing they want to do is more change. They want peace, guys. We all need peace and joy. So people have not sold. So there are pent up demand to sell. When you hear that again, there's pent-up demand not to buy, but to sell. There's a lot of people waiting to sell. You guys know clients that have sold. Now, if they're selling now, they're selling really fast because there's no inventory. But there's a lot of people waiting until the spring, guys. There's a lot of people waiting until the spring to list. And so now you're going to have foreclosures hitting in the winter. Now you're going to have 2020 homeowners that never sold hitting in the winter. And you're going to have 2021 homeowners that starts selling in the winter and early spring in a normal year. And so then the next question is, well, what if the vaccine works? Well, the vaccine works, which I believe it will, which will be an answer to many prayers, the housing market supply is actually going to triple. If the vaccine takes longer, if we don't have enough of them, if it takes longer to prove success, 
that we can have a little bit of 2020 in 2021, which means that the foreclosures are hitting the market, which means that a lot of the 2020 homeowners are going to go on the market, which means some of the 2021 homeowners are going to hit the market, but the buyers are still going to be hanging tight. The pandemic has to go away to really see the economy um, and what's going to happen. Um, let's go back to the economy for a second. Guys, where these foreclosures come from? These foreclosures came from people who, whose businesses were shut down. It's not a political conversation. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. So many people have suffered and so many people are suffering. Regardless of their business shut down because of an order to be safe or regardless of their business shut down because of a lack of demand, millions of business owners, businesses shut down and they did a forbearance or a foreclosure. We haven't seen the effects of that yet. There was a lot of PPP dollars. There was stimulus dollars. We're going to talk about that in a moment, how that affects. And I'm throwing a lot at you guys. I hope it's okay. You know, I want to give you like the entire macro economy, the entire housing market, the bring down to Charlotte, what this means to your own family in like an hour and a half. So I hope you don't mind them throwing a lot at you. We can have a whole conversation about the dollar, guys. We can have a whole morning conversation about the housing market. We can have a whole morning conversation. Um, so Shannon's asking how this affect commercial real estate. I can't see the whole chat, but I'll tell you right now, commercial real estate lags. Um, and so Shannon, if that's your question, people are, are not buying commercial real estate. Um, people are not leasing commercial real estate. And so, yeah, Shannon asked a great question. What's, what's going on with commercial real estate? And here's the bottom line. Yeah, let's throw that one out there, Shannon. How many for lease signs you see? How many for sale signs you see? See, here's the thing. That's actually a great question. I really appreciate you asking that because it's going to make things really clear for you about what's going to happen in the housing market and what's happening in the economy. People aren't selling their house because they're scared to move. People aren't selling their house because they need a safe haven. People aren't selling the house because their home is their only place of certainty, right? But people can't afford to stay in their commercial space. So when you're seeing for sale and for lease in some of the most popular shopping centers in the Charlotte area, you know, I went down to Charleston, every other building was shut down. You go to Blakeney and Phil's Place, Stonecrest, things are shut down. Movie theaters are shut down. Restaurants are shut down. Offices are shut down. You see for sale and for lease everywhere because there's no emotion, guys. In the house, there's emotion. In business, it's all logic. And so when the business owner says, it's either my family or this business, the business gets shut down. So Shannon, commercial real estate supply is through the roof. So what happens to demand? We always talk about how Econ 101 says that if supply goes up and demand goes down, then prices go down. But we don't talk that often about the seesaw of when supply goes up, demand dramatically comes down, right? Because if there's a lot of tickle me elmos, no one wants it. No one's in a rush. When three homes are on the same street, they're like, I'm in no rush. I can wait. So what's happening in commercial real estate right now? Commercial real estate right now, there's five times as many offices as there were in January. So businesses that do want to do something are in no rush. Businesses that had to get out are struggling and they couldn't pay their, their lease. They couldn't pay their mortgage payments. So Shannon, here's what happens. Commercial space is dropping, right? The prices are starting to drop. You haven't seen that really on a macro scale yet because again, we're not seeing a lot yet, guys. What we're talking about here is what we expect to see in the first couple quarters of 2021. A lot of the landlords have not reduced pricing on commercial yet because they're hopeful that the business owner will come in and pay the lease. A lot of the landlords that have not reduced the price for lease yet or put their own building up for sale is because they're hopeful that another business is coming. But my question, because they're thinking that when the pandemic goes away, guys, with the vaccine, because the pandemic will go away, right? Like the vaccine will come either in one or two or three supply loads and enough people will take it. It will, it will, it will go through the system and it'll start working and, and, and then we'll start being able to be safe again. And then we'll be able to, even if we're still social distancing and using masks, we'll at least be able to start um, going out and having more normalcy. We'll be able to protect our family and, and we'll be able to go out even with lowered immune systems because we're now protected. You know, either we had coronavirus or we had the vaccine. So we are moving towards that. It's not gonna go on forever. But commercial is struggling. Someone said, I've heard of several businesses. I'm gonna read this real fast. 
Um, I appreciate the chats. I've heard several businesses are going to all remote as they've seen no issue in employee production remotely and are going to save money and paying rent. And that looks like it was private, but this is actually a great question. Whoever asked that, because it says client care. So here's the thing. A lot of businesses are going remote and that's never going to change. So Shannon, two things. One, a lot of businesses can't afford the space. And two, for at least another year or two, guys, people are remote. I mean, we meet regularly and we do social distancing and we are safe and, um, and, and we are um, very sensitive to if someone can't come, don't come. If someone can come, please come. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. Please social distance and please be respectful of others. Um, and we can do this without being in person. And, you know, one of the reasons why we made our move back in, or, you know, this summer, guys, is because we realized that it's culture first and that we can serve each other and our families and the communities through culture over production, through people over profits. And so we don't need the big building. Now we're going to get our space. We're just being really smart for timing. So let's, I don't want to digress. Let's keep moving forward. So if you're in commercial real estate, uh, we may have some commercial folks on the call. If you're in commercial real estate, uh, just be mindful that demand is really low. And housing hasn't gotten there yet on the residential side, but commercial is already there. Demand is really low. Just drive down the road, guys. We overcomplicate things. Drive down the road and you'll see more and more for sale signs. Drive down the road for commercial buildings. You'll see more and more for lease signs, boarded up buildings, empty buildings. What does that mean? It means supply is really high, which pushes down demand. It means supply is really high, which means even if demand is high, prices drop. So what that means is commercial is already falling. Now, that's actually another great question. We talk about housing is that what happens to residential real estate versus commercial? Well, commercial guys lags because not emotional. See, people aren't selling their house because they don't feel, they feel safe in their house. So I want you to think about this for a second, okay? We're going really into the weeds now, but hopefully it's helpful. People are not selling their house because they feel safe in their house. It's their safe haven. They're not selling their house because they don't feel comfortable going on vacation. They're not selling their house because they feel more comfortable, like we said a minute ago, working from home. It's a lot of feelings and, and that's rightfully so. We're doing this call via Zoom to be respectful of safety. Commercial is different, guys. Commercial is all about the numbers and logic. So for history, when commercial goes down, real estate on the residential side follows. When condos go down, what follows? Townhomes. When townhomes go down, what follows? Houses. Because the house is not just logic, the house is emotion. And so a lot of what we saw this year on the residential side was people stayed in their home and people bought the big home with the big pool and the big backyard and the big space and the high utility bills, not because of logic, but because of emotion. People that had all this equity that couldn't afford their payment, that did forbearance versus selling, that crushed their credit, they didn't hold their house because of logic, it was because of emotion. Now commercial, they can't make their payment, they're out. They're not going to lose their house to keep their business. But what does commercial mean for residential? It's a great question, Ken. I really appreciate you asking because it shows what's happening. So commercial is falling. You know what's else falling in the real estate market, guys? Condos. Now, here's my question for you guys. And we're about to go back into macroeconomics. We're just getting to the weeds a little bit in residential real estate. Are condos falling because it's the beginning of a decline in the housing market? Or are condos falling because... Um, no one feels comfortable being in a condo complex with the pandemic. I don't know. It's probably a little bit of both, but these are the great conversations to have together on this call. These are the great conversations to have with your family. These are the great conversations to have with your clients. I think it's a little bit of both. When the pandemic starts going away, what I bet is going to happen is some people will look for the condo versus the big house. And when they look for the condo versus the big house, they sell their big house. What happens when they sell their big house? Supply goes up, right? They're not, there's not extra people looking to buy when the pandemic goes away, maybe so. There's extra people selling because more people own the big house right now than the condo. More condos are gonna be in foreclosure. More condos are being rented out. People don't live in the condos right now. They live in the big house. So when the pandemic goes away and they go back on vacation, they don't need the big backyard at the pool. When the pandemic goes away and commercial real estate's at an all-time low, and now we can afford 
to buy commercial space and to lease commercial space at a discount, what happens? We go back to work. When schools are open back up five days a week, you guys see it. Schools were shut down. Now they're open two, four, or five days a week. Businesses were shut down. Now they're starting to open. People are going to start leaving their house again. Let's talk about macro again. We have no question here. If time allows, can you also comment on the effect on investors? Well, Leslie, it's a great question. That's an easy one. If, if real estate market starts going down, that's great for investors. Um, that's amazing for investors. I mean, the good news is, the good news, guys, is that a recession does not lead to a housing market decline. The bad news is we're probably going to have a second recession. Now, what does that mean? We'll talk about investors in a second. We're going back to macroeconomics. The first recession happens. You guys should definitely tell everyone you know that we had a recession and let them ask you questions of what that means because there's a stigma on the recession. But this year proved that a recession is just a data point. It's, it's literally no more, no less than two straight quarters of negative GDP. That's all it is. But what it does, guys, is it's the dark cloud two miles up the road on 77 that you know you're about to drive into a storm. Right, like you're not there yet, but you're like, oh wow, there's a recession. Um, what does that mean for me? Like you lag behind the dark cloud. Does that make sense? You know, you're driving in 77, you see the dark cloud, you're like, oh boy, here we go. It's beautiful where I am, but two miles ahead is a dark cloud. Right? The recession is showing us what is going to happen. The reason for the negative GDP, the reason for the low or high unemployment rates, the reason that commercial buildings are shutting down is because people don't have jobs guys people business shut down they have to lay people off people get laid off they can't put pump money into the, the economy people don't put money into the economy profits go down companies start losing money and you're thinking that doesn't make sense the stock market's at an all-time high the stock market is at an all-time high why is that well one reason that economists would say that the stock market's at an all-time high after coming out of a recession uh, is because people don't know where else to put their money. They really don't. You know, housing market is too high. Supply is too low. They can't buy houses. Gold is too high. Silver is too high. Um, and, and, and stock market actually feels kind of safe. Plus, because of tax benefits, a lot of people have to keep their money in the stock market. But the wealthiest people that are a lot smarter than me, guys, their money's not in the stock market right now. Their, their money is in cash. I mean, a lot of people should be keeping the money in cash. I'm not telling you to buy a house. I'm telling you that you probably should keep your money in cash. Uh, let's keep on the macroeconomics. So we had a recession and you're thinking, huh, it kind of came and went, but I feel like the housing market's at an all time high. Huh, it kind of came and went, but the stock market's at an all time high. Most people, on, if ever, not everyone on this call has a job. You guys are thinking like, my money in the stock market's at an all time high. My 401k is at an all time high. My house has never had more equity. I don't understand. How did we just have a recession? Well, guys, the dark cloud two miles ahead hasn't rained on you yet. So do you turn the, the windshield wiper on now or do you wait until you're in the pouring rain and then your kid's screaming in the back seat and then you can't find it and then your cell phone's ringing? I mean, you, know, you never take calls, Christos, in the car, right? I mean, like, I know I don't, but maybe some of my friends do. And the next thing you know, you're like, well, I can text when I'm in the sunshine, but now I'm in a storm. How do I text in the storm? And then the world just, just like that, there's a car accident. So what I want you guys to see is, what I want you guys to see is the, Real recession, thank you, my friend. I got a private message that says the real recession is still out there is absolutely the case, which is why, guys, the data points say the recession is two straight quarters of negative GDP, and that happens. Then we had a quarter of tremendous GDP to offset the negative GDP in the second quarter, and now most are, economists are expecting another recession. It's called a double recession. And here's what's going to happen this time around. If you remember when we talked a couple months ago, we talked about how the media will start talking about the economy after the election, after the pandemic. Hey, I've got a dear friend reporter on this call right now who's thinking, okay, well, we know who our president's gonna be. We have uh, a new president coming in in a month. We know the vaccines are arriving very soon, thank God. So some, we have some certainty, so what's next? What's next, guys, is we need to look back to the recession and what the effects are and what's gonna happen next. So guys, here's why I believe we're going to have a double recession. Well, again, what is a recession? A recession is two straight quarters of negative GDP. Well, 
We just talked about how forbearance is just coming due now. So forbearances have an effect the first recession because that was over already. So what are forbearances going to do? Well, let's see. When forbearances don't get paid off, again, they, they didn't make a payment for three months. Now they have to make four payments at once. Where's that money coming from? Well, guys, it's not coming. They're foreclosing. We talked about a whole summer and fall of foreclosures. When those homes hit the market and it affects the housing market, what happens to those people that are now not in their home? I expect a double recession for many reasons, but from I don't want to like try to sound smarter than I am, guys. Let's just call out the elephant in the room. When you drive down the road and businesses are shut down, when you see that people are foreclosing and forbearances, and by the way, guys, if you don't know anyone who owns a business that's shut down, that's a blessing. If you don't know anyone who's done forbearance, I'm sure you do. If you don't know one that's foreclosing, I'm sure you do, but it's a blessing if you don't. It's because people don't put on Facebook how honored and grateful they are to be going through a bad financial position. People don't put on Facebook that their business shut down. People don't put on Facebook that they didn't make their mortgage payment so they could put food on the table. You know, many in our gang, you know, we're focusing on many families in the community that early this year were in a great place financially. So here's the thing, the first recession already happened. We have not seen the worst of this yet. Now that's not the end of the world because we needed a correction. That's not the end of the world because there's a lot of buyers that can't afford to buy a car. They can't afford to buy a house. They can't afford to pay for things because everything's so expensive. So it's not the end of the world. What does a recession do? A recession brings down prices. So the good news is recession brings down prices. The bad news is recession brings down prices. Now, why didn't the first recession bring down prices? Well, the first recession didn't bring down prices because there was no inventory. There was no inventory for houses. Now, the first recession did down, bring down prices on cars. The first recession did bring down prices on furniture. You know how I know that? The 10-year treasury rate on July 31st was at a 234-year low. The government can't make you lower the price of a Chevy Suburban. The government can't make you lower the price at Bassett Furniture. These are private held companies. Does that make sense? What the government can do is say you can buy it for free. You can't, excuse me, you can't buy it for free, but you can borrow it for free. Does that make sense? So when you see like Scott Clark Toyota, I'm just using his name, I don't know if he did this or not, said 0% financing. Guys, that's the government saying on the front end, we're going to lower the rate as low as possible for you to be able to work with banks to lend money as cheap as possible. But there's no 0% financing, guys. There might be one and a half, two percent. There might even be 0.8 percent. We're about one percent right now. The 10 year rate right now is about one percent. But there's no zero percent financing. When the Toyota dealership, when the Lexus dealership, when the Chevy dealership says zero percent financing, who's eating the other percentage point? It's the car dealer, guys. It's the seller. When furniture dealerships say no interest financing for a year, guys, money's not free. We're going to talk about that in a second. I hope you're seeing we're unpacking all this. See, guys, I got to throw a lot at you, but I have to do it as slow and methodical as physically possible for the New York City boy. Because, you know, my two little boys, if I just let them go, go to town under the Christmas tree, they'll open all the presents, they'll rip them all up, and then they'll be like, wait, where's the gifts? And I'm like, yeah, boys, I mean, one of my sons cried last year because he was so tired. I'm, I'm not joking, guys. For anyone who has kids, um, Glenn, you got two, two boys that are older. Daryl, we got a lot of people on this call. I, I, I know, you know, Brad's got one boy. I mean, a lot of you guys have boys. Abby, you got four girls. Captain, you have a girl. But I don't think it matters if it's a boy or a girl. But, but my boys were so tired. They started crying because they didn't slow down and unpack the gifts. They didn't slow down to see what was to come so they can appreciate it. So what I'm trying to do is unpack a lot of data points, unpack a lot of history for you so that so that and Shannon likes to tell us all that we cry when we get tired. Shannon, this is a, an econ talk, okay? But, um, but I do appreciate Shannon sharing that. Um, I want to unpack a lot of data points so you can see history. I want to slow down so you can see what's really happening. I want you guys to unpack this because you're all really smart so you can actually see the gifts so we can give it to our family because you need the knowledge so that you can provide wisdom. So Scott asks, isn't debt good if huge inflation comes? Do you think hyperinflation will come in the coming recession? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Scott. So, so um, um, I hope that inflation does come. Uh, you know, inflation is necessary. So I'll tell you what has to happen and what needs to happen and what I think will happen 
but no guarantee of what will happen. I, if 2020 told us anything, guys, if 2020 showed us anything, you know, I, I, I share this all the time with sometimes with you guys, sometimes with my friends, um, outside of real estate, sometimes with my family. I'm like, you know, the bad news is it could be a lot worse than you expect. The good news is it's out of your control because it could be a lot worse than you expect, right? Like, like you, you know, a lot of anxiety and fear comes from worrying about what can happen. Hey, if you had so much fear that you projected the pandemic, holy cow, you should, you know, have a TV show right now and write a book because no one saw this coming. So you can't even worry enough about how bad it could be. So don't worry at all. So to Scott's question, guys, inflation is a good thing when it's because of demand. Inflation is a really good thing. And that's what leads to debt. Um, that's what leads to, to borrowing is that when people want to consume. The challenge is, is right now the dollar is at an almost all time low. It's got the dollar is down almost 13% year over year because we just keep printing money. We just keep increasing our deficit. You, know, you have good debt and bad debt. And so what's happening is there is no demand right now. And so what's happening is it's the worst of both worlds because on the front end, the dollar keeps going down because we're printing money. You know, Brad and I, and maybe some of y'all collect baseball cards. I know Glenn used to. Glenn, we got to get you back into it. I don't know if anyone else does. But why are people collecting baseball cards? One, because it's a fun hobby for them and their kids. Two, because it's another investment tool. But that's not the point. The point is this. If you get a one-of-one -one LeBron James autograph rookie patch, this, that, it's worth all the money in the world because it's a one of one. There's only one of them. You know, the reason why gold is worth so much is, is you can't make gold. You have to find it, right? Silver is worth less because there's more of it. It's not as scarce. But the dollar, guys, is this. All it is is this. And when we print it, we're printing because there's no demand. When we print it, it's because the demand is that we need the dollar, not what the dollar can provide. Does that make sense? But when we don't have jobs, we need more of this. So in the short run, we get that. We get that in the way of stimulus. We get that in the way of short-term relief. But that's why money markets at all-time low. That's why the stock market crashed in March is because we didn't have enough demand. And so we just had to keep printing money. We just keep printing money. And, and, and so, so, yeah, we need inflation, Scott. The challenge is to get to inflation, we need demand. The challenge is to get to demand, we need certainty. The challenge is to get to certainty, people need jobs and they need the economy to bounce back and we're about to hit a second recession. And so what happens after a recession? In the short run, you usually have stagnation. In the short run, in 2009, we even had deflation. That's all bad, guys. It feels good when prices go down on cars. It feels good when prices go down on furniture. But again, guys, prices have already gone down. You may not have seen it in real estate. You may not even see it on cars when you see $80,000 Suburbans. But again, the rate at 0% means it's gone down. And so Scott's question is such a great one. The fact that there is a lot of pent up need for inflation, guys. There's a lot of pent up need for prices to go up. Um, and, and, but, but, but we can't because there's not enough demand. So it's gonna happen. And so the question is, do we have stagnation or deflation? Now, here's some good news. Here's some good news. If inflation kicks in, which may take a year, may take three years, I don't know. I'd love to see what you guys think about this. That's how the housing market bounces back. To Scott's point, if we had inflation right now, guys, real estate would be even stronger. Because on the front end, people wouldn't have as much buying power because coffee would cost more and their utilities would go up. But on the back end, corporations will be able to charge more. And, you know, on the price of goods, guys, the price of building costs went through the roof this year. You guys know that, right? Talk about inflation. So, Scott, we had some real estate inflation this year. We had real estate inflation this year from people wanting the bigger home. We had real estate inflation this year from people wanting um, the big backyard and the pool. We had real estate inflation this year from a lack of supply. We also had real estate inflation this year from building costs almost doubling. Do you guys know that? That builders just kept raising prices and raising prices? But you, you're not hearing me say the word demand. You're not hearing me say that buyers want to buy. You don't hear me talk about buyers a lot. You're not hearing me talk about potential inflation because guys, inflation is the best thing that could happen. 
if you don't think inflation always happens every decade, then what did your house cost that your parents raised you in in the 70s and 80s? What did a cup of coffee cost in 1995? What did diapers cost, Glenn, when your boys were in diapers? <laughs> when the Mets were winning the World Series? Like, what did diapers cost? They didn't cost the $80 a box that Jessica and I are paying. You know, like, I'm like, I'm like, Knox, you got to get out of diapers, bud. You know, I, I mean, we can't afford for you to pretend that you're still a one-year-old. Um, Shan saying, you're making me feel old. Please go easy. So, yeah, your kids have not been in diapers for a long time. Anyway, I'm digressing, guys. I love these chats. These are awesome, and they're fun, and um, I, appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate everyone just being genuine and real. Um, I hope that and I hope I'm answering the questions in real time. So let's go back to macroeconomics for a second. We had a recession. If you put on Facebook that we had a recession, if you put on Instagram, I don't know if you, I don't have an Instagram account. So I don't know if you can write that, but you can tweet. You know, we had a recession earlier this year. Tell me why I'm wrong. We had a recession earlier this year. What does that mean? We had a recession this year. Do you believe, agree with me? Or, Hey, even better, guys, don't tell anyone anything. No one wants to be told. No one wants to be told in their marriage. No one wants to be told in their friendships. No one wants to be told. My kids don't want to be told. My wife doesn't want to be told. My friends, you guys don't want to be told. I try not to tell you guys anything. I try to just share the facts and let you guys self-discover. I just want to ask the questions. You want to ask your family the questions. You want to ask your clients the questions. We had a recession this year. Well, first of all, did we have a recession? Well, the answer is yes, guys. So you can ask or tell. What does that mean? What have you seen drop? Well, Scott, in a, after a recession, you usually have stagnation or deflation. And so we need to get to inflation. The challenge is we're still wondering if there's going to be a second recession. And I think the answer is yes. So we had our first recession, then we had one quarter. Guys, knowing everything that you know as smart people, Knowing anything you know from the last 45 minutes, do you believe that the fourth quarter is going to be positive or negative GDP? Because I think negative. So put in the chat if you think that GDP is going to go up in the fourth quarter. Put in the chat if you think it's going to go down. Because if commercial is shutting down, if businesses are shutting down, if people's forbearances are coming due, if foreclosures are growing, if more and more people are out of work, then does it mean that GDP is going to go up or down? And, um, I, um, you know, Catherine, um, so Brad said GDP up and forth, down and first. Catherine said down. Sherry said down. Scott said down. So um, Brad saying GDP up and forth, down and first. Now, so it's interesting. So there's no right or wrong until it happens. I have to imagine the reason why Brad's saying up and forth um, is because it lags. And, and so I can't say right or wrong until it happens. So Brad's going to say, and I'm Linda saying up. So here's the thing, guys. We won't know until it happens. But here's the thing. That's why we're having the call today and not in January. That's why we're having the, the call this week and not next month is because once GDP comes out, once gross domestic product shows demand is either high or low, it's too late. And once you have one quarter, you're one quarter away. So look, if Brad's right, then it means the second quarter needs to happen for a recession. If some of y'all are right, Sherry and Scott and Catherine, that means if the fourth quarter is down, that means the first quarter going down means that we're back in a recession on April 1st. Now, what does that mean for everything else? Well, here's the thing, guys. When forbearances come due and people can't pay their, their payment, because now there's four of them, they sell. Hopefully they sell with equity, just with a depressed credit that increases inventory. When foreclosures, when they say move out or sell, some people are going to sell. A lot of people are going to move out, but some people are going to sell because we do have equity. So the good news is a lot of people going to foreclosure, guys, they can sell. If we can put pride aside and be honest with ourselves and we're not doing as well financially as we'd like to think, or well, our soccer accounts feel good, and I'm begging you, if you have post-tax dollars, sell today. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Some of you guys have already done it. Do not have pre-tax dollars in the stock market right now, guys. Or, or so post-tax. Pre-tax, put it in there. You know, you're, you're saving money on taxes. Post-tax, put it in cash. Put it in cash to protect your family. Put it in cash to protect your neighbor's family. If you're in such a great place financially that you can risk the stock market going down 25% in the next few months, then help families in need. Help families the best Christmas ever. Help families in your church or temple. Give that money somewhere else. Or just keep some under the mattress. Protect your cash. 
So if negative GDP happens in the fourth quarter, then we're one quarter away from the recession. If negative GDP happens in the first quarter, then we're one quarter more away from the recession. But what happens with the second recession? Well, here's the thing. Let's unpack this a little more and we'll get there. And I hope we're unpacking a lot here, guys. I hope I'm making sense. I don't mean to seem like I'm rambling. I'm just throwing a lot of data points out there. And I'm trying to go back and forth of what this means and how it ties to this, what this means and how it ties to that. You know, there's a lot of moving parts here. The good news is, regardless of the housing market in the nation, we're in one of the most popular parts of the country. Regardless of the housing market in San Francisco and New York City, a lot of people from San Francisco and New York City are moving to Charlotte. A lot of people from San Francisco and Portland, and Seattle and New York City and New Jersey are moving to Austin and Tampa. A lot of people move into Tampa and Clearwater and St. Pete and Fort Myers and Naples. They move halfway back to Charlotte and to Raleigh. Does that make sense? So even if we go into a housing bust, which we will eventually because we can't go up forever. I mean, guys, just because, and I love y'all, and obviously I'm biased, just because we win both bidding wars, it means other people are losing the bidding wars. And sometimes we lose the bidding war. When we lose the bidding war, our buyer has to say, huh, I'm really discouraged right now. I'm going to the weeds, guys. I stay high level in macroeconomics, weeds for microeconomics, and the most important part for that, us is real estate, right? Real estate and mortgage. Guys, when we lose a bidding war, what do our buyers say? Well, I'll get it next time. I'll just keep going higher in price. Well, guys, sometimes they lose a bidding war because they can't afford it. Sometimes they lose a bidding war because, they're, because they don't want to pay anymore. They don't feel comfortable with their family. So what do they do? They back off. They wait. They hold. Demand goes down. So it feels good that we're in bidding wars when you win them. But what about the buyers that lose them? What happens after the bidding wars? I hate roller coasters, you guys. My stomach is so queasy. I can't even watch a roller coaster. My three-year-old son and my six-year-old and Jessica, they went on the roller coasters. Um, we were in Pigeon Forge, and I were like, went and said, well, hey, you guys do the roller coaster. I'll just go get us lunch reservations because I love you guys so much. I just want to get us on the wait. And they're like, oh, that's so sweet of you. I'm like, yeah, and I can actually eat my lunch because I can't do the roller coaster. Well, guys, we talk about how housing prices are at an all-time high. We talk about how stock market prices are at an all-time high. We talk about how interest rates for 10-year treasury are at an all-time low and mortgage rates are at an all-time low. But what happens when the people in the bidding war lose the bidding war? And I'll get to Scott's question in a minute. That's a great one, man. What happens when all the people in the bidding war, talk about houses and market for a second, when all the people in the bidding war lose the bidding war and housing prices are at an all-time high? Some of those people will go out the next bidding war and pay even more. But eventually, guys, the money run, runs out. Teresa is the best, but Teresa can't tell you if you make $45,000 a year, you can buy a $900,000 house. You can only buy a certain... Why do you think the last market collapsed, guys? Why do you think we had the Great Depression of 2009? Because then people just kept buying and buying and buying. And yes, you're right, Shannon, we don't lose bidding wars, but there are people that do lose bidding wars. And what happens is some of them back off from the next house because they get discouraged and they rent. Some people back off from the next house because prices keep going up and they can't afford to go high enough. And some people back off from the next house because they don't qualify to go high enough. See where my hand is? It's in nowhere to land. Bidding wars can't go up forever. Guys, the housing market is at the highest peak and the highest peak of the highest peak of the highest peak from everything we've talked about and everything you're experiencing. You can't lose a bidding war and just keep going higher and higher. If you win the bidding war, great. You probably still overpaid, but you borrowed at the bottom. But if you lose a bidding war, guys, it's gonna be hard to go back at it. If you go back at it, don't pay a higher price. The people that are going back out of paying a higher price are probably overpaying. But you know what's happening? More and more people are not doing the bidding war. And they're going on the sidelines. Scott asks, with Biden coming in, do you think enough stimulus and QE could prevent another recession and keep artificial inflation high? So it's a great, it's a great question, Scott. And, and so I think it's going to, you know, so a couple of things that Biden's going to do coming in, because he is coming in, guys, um, um, in January, um, is he's got a tax credit. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the housing market and then talk about the economy as a whole. So he has a couple of projected tax credits. If you remember um, in the last recession, the last housing market bust, we had a $7,508,000 tax credit. President-elect Biden's actually talking about a $15,000 credit. And so to Scott's point, what is artificial inflation? It's when prices keep going up, um, not because of real demand, but because of pumped up demand, either because I've got stimulus checks coming in or because I have a credit that empowers me to do something, right? Like, when down payment assistance says you can buy a house with no money down, sometimes people are buying a house not because they want or need the house because it's free money, right? So basically the question is, 
Is it possible that free money could prevent another recession and keep artificial inflation high? It, it's possible, Scott, but here's the thing. Two different things here. On the front end, recession has a negative connotation, right? Recession, people look at recession, they equate it to economic collapse and despair and uncertainty. But the, but the recession is really as simple as two straight quarters of negative GDP. And so I do think we're going to have a double recession, not because of Trump or Biden, but because of it's going to happen before a lot of President-elect Biden's um, policies can be enacted. It's going to happen before people can realize that. Now, some people get encouraged when a policy that's coming down the pike could benefit them, right? Like just knowing about the vaccine encourages people. Just knowing about a, um, a tax cut for some people might help. Just knowing about a stimulus check coming could encourage people. So if there is some potential more stimulus coming, if there's some potential tax credits uh, for families, both for families with kids as well as for housing, that can get us out of recession faster, Scott. But I don't think it stops the recession, the double recession, because I think that's already coming. So some of y'all said that it's going to be fourth quarter and then first. And some of y'all said first quarter and second, but it's already kind of happening, if that makes sense. Um, and then any policies in 2021 could encourage spending. It could encourage uh, travel. It can encourage business. It could stimulate the economy uh, to get us out of the recession. But again, the irony is, Scott, to your point, the irony is a recession actually is a great buyer's market. It's a great buyer's market for cars and real estate. It's a great buyer's market for commodities because in the short run, there is no inflation, right? In the short run, there's deflation or stagnation. You don't really don't want deflation, but it happens. So I want you guys to hear that, guys. When you're in a recession, it's a great time to buy. Then why, then why were housing prices so high if it was such a great time to buy? It's because of the false demand from the pandemic. And, and so going to 2021, to Scott's point, um, we're going to have some false inflation. We're going to have some false pricing um, where people travel because they feel like they can afford it. Um, we are going to have some false um, pricing on cars because people are going to buy because they can afford it because the treasury rate is essentially free. You know, like I can get free money or I can get rebates. And so Scott's point, the stimulus is going to encourage people to spend. You know, there's a lot of people, thankfully, because of past stimulus that spent money. You know, um, the Christmas spending season, the Hanukkah spending season, guys, is at like an all time high because people have free, not free, but like, you know, when you get a stimulus check, it's needed and it came from somewhere. Again, in the short run, we need, in the long run, this is what it's worth, right? So in the short run, we're spending. In the short run, I love that Scott said that because he's right. It seems like, Scott, you're an economist too, man. And um, you do your homework. I mean, I, I love that you dig into the facts. There's some artificial inflation happening right now. But guys, in a recession, what happens? It's not inflation. It's, depre it's deflation. It's stagnation. So what does this all mean? It sounds like it's all convoluted. What does it all mean? So you're unpacking all these gifts for your kids. You're unpacking all these you know, this, this mail that comes in the mailbox. And then you kind of slow down and look at what you just unpacked. What does this all mean? Well, the recession doesn't always lead to a housing market drop. Six out of 10 times, it doesn't. Um, but the la And the last time it did, so this time it probably means it won't. And it hasn't yet. But here's my first question from the housing market level. We'll start down here. We'll go back up to the macro level. When the pandemic goes away, I'm gonna, un I'm gonna unpack this all now. You've opened the gift and now your kid's like, open this up more, open this up more, read the book to me, get the game set up and everything. So now you unpack the box, you've unpacked the wrapping paper, you unpack the bow. Now we actually have a gift. We actually have to learn how to play, right? We have to learn how to get our glasses on. I'm getting older, my eyes aren't as good. So I open, unpack a gift that has a book. My son says, read the book to me. I'm like, son, I have to take off my glasses, put on contacts. He's like, but son, but dad, you had glasses on. I'm digressing, but the glasses aren't good enough. I can't see clearly. So I hope you guys are seeing clearly to see this gift that we're unpacking right now. So now we've unpacked the gift and now we have this Nintendo Switch, thankfully, to open and to set up and to charge and to play. So what does that mean? We've unpacked the box, we haven't unpacked the game. So what does this actually mean, this game? Guys, we had a recession already. It doesn't mean that the housing market goes down, but a double recession absolutely means the housing market goes down because a double recession means that the first one didn't do the job. The double recession means the first one didn't bring prices low enough. 
The double recession means that the first one didn't last long enough to get people back to work. The first one didn't bring prices low enough to stimulate the economy. The first one didn't bring prices low enough to pump money into businesses. And now you're seeing more and more businesses shutting down. That doesn't happen after a recession. That happens during a recession. After a recession, the economy improves. So I do think we'll have a double recession. And the double recession is going to push the housing market over the edge because people can't just keep losing bidding wars and paying higher and higher prices. People can't keep building bigger and bigger houses and paying 200 grand for a pool that costs 60,000. People can just keep committing to paying limitless price hikes when building costs go up and up. You know, right now, if you build a home, not with our new homes division, because we are semi-custom where we guarantee the price on the front end. But do you know that if you buy a custom home right now, they will not guarantee your price until you close? You guys know that? Do you know that the average $500,000 house will go up 10 to 15% before you close if it's custom, no matter where it is, if it's in Rock Hill or Shelby, if it's in Concord or Mooresville, if you buy a home that has not predetermined the materials and you have not guaranteed your pricing on the front end, they will have a five to 15% margin in there to increase building costs. That, Scott, is artificial, um, artificial inflation because the buyer is not saying that they want to pay that price. There is not this large number of buyers building right now. There isn't because there's not a lot of housing starts. There needs to be more. But there's not a lot of the buyers building. What it is, is businesses are shut down. What it is, is there's no manufacturing. What it is, is we're not getting the imports that we were getting from China. We're not creating as much manufacturing in-house right now because of the pandemic to, for the United States and for exporting. You see what's happening here? You see how the real estate market and the macroeconomics all kind of come together and meet? And right now it looks like it's meeting here, but it really needs to be meeting here. And so you're paying a premium to buy a brand new house to build from scratch, not because of demand, but because of lack of supply. You're paying a premium when Megan lists a house in Rosemont because there's no supply. She won't list two homes at the same time. She waits for one to sell, which is easier now because she sells them fast and there's no inventory. You see where I'm going with this, guys? None of this is because of demand. It's all because of supply. You know, I know that not because I have a crystal ball, but because the treasury rate would not be in an all time low if everyone wanted to buy cars and furniture and take trips. You know, I know that because mortgage rates would not be at an all time low if everyone wanted a loan. Now, the housing market seems really strong. And it's okay if the housing market drops because it means there's a lot of buyers on the fence that can't afford. The three buyers that lose the bidding war, there's no houses for them. The three buyers that lose the bidding war, they can't afford to buy the more expensive house. I tell people to buy semi-custom guys, not custom, because you can protect your pricing. You can guarantee your pricing on the front end. Um, it's artificial inflation, like Scott said. So, okay, the double recession, the double recession. Guys, the first recession should bring down prices, which corrects the economy. It did not do that, partially because of a pandemic, well, probably because of the pandemic. The pandemic is so abnormal, guys. The pandemic is so unseen or heard of before that when the recession happened, people said, I don't care that the economy is at an all-time low. I'm buying the big house. I keep talking about housing market, one, because we're all in real estate, but two, because that's where people have spent their money in 2020. Does that make sense? People have spent their money in 2020 on houses. That is by far the number one thing that people have done. They have not put it into their business. That's why PPP existed, to salvage businesses. Um, they did not put it into travel. Travel was shut down because of the pandemic and because of a lack of um, additional income and dollars. They put it into their house. Shannon asks, what does this mean for builders? Shannon, the best position, best seat in the bus is a semi-custom builder. Ironically enough, most of our builders are semi-custom because they can guarantee um, pricing on the front end. And if they have warehouses, they're buying so much stuff, guys. They're buying so much lumber. They're buying so much. You know, we talk about not buying gold and silver because it's so high. You also don't want to buy lumber right now because it's so high, right? There's so much artificial inflation. And I keep going back to Scott's comment right here because it's so true. Everything feels good. Everything looks good. Everyone feels good that they have equity in their house. Everyone feels good because they have 
equity in their stock market. But what Scott said is so true, keep artificial inflation high. It's not real inflation. So what happens if we, I hope you guys understand and agree that we're gonna have a second recession, which is almost unheard of. Guys, in 2009, we had one recession that went on for a long time. That is ironically enough, better. The reason why we keep doing these state of economies and sounds like some things I'm doing, I'm talking like a broken record is because I want to be a broken record. I want to just keep being the broken record until you're so annoying that you can't get it out of your head. Because here's the thing, guys, in 2006, 7, 8, 9, when the economy started crashing, it was obvious. When we went in a recession, it was right in front of your face. But now the recession came and went so fast, you didn't even see it. And you're like, oh, the economy's coming back and 2021 is going to be amazing and the pandemic's going to go away. Hopefully the pandemic does go away. And we have a new president and that's going to be good too. Like it's all fine. Like that is all good stuff because regardless if you believe in the pandemic or not, believe, regardless if you believe in the president or not, it does not matter. It's all true is that people are dying from the pandemic. People need certainty and the virus going away is good. People need certainty with the president. And regardless if it's Biden, who it is, or if it was going to be Trump, it didn't matter. They needed certainty. That's why you saw a hike in the stock market. And so people feel a little better right now with the certainty. They feel a little better knowing the stock market's an all-time high and they have equity in their house and they have cash. Because guys, on the surface, everyone on this call feels pretty good. And if you don't feel good, it's probably because you know someone who's in a bad place. But that can come to you really quick, guys. That can come to you really quick if you have a house with equity and we don't do something with that in real time. That can come to you really quick if you have a bunch of money in stocks and you don't move it to cash. That can come to you really quick if you live in the market you're in, not the market you're going in. And forget about housing for a second. What does a double recession mean? A double recession means there's more unemployment to come. A double recession means, and by the way, when unemployment is high, how's the stock market high? How's unemployment high and the stock market's high? It doesn't make sense, does it? It's not real, guys. It's not real. I'm going to go one last time to Scott's point, artificial inflation. Guys, we have artificial inflation. You know what's worse than artificial inflation? Nothing. Because at least in 2009, we had deflation. At least in 2009, we had deflation where prices were so low that you can buy houses for free and you can buy things for free and cars dropped. But here's the thing. Car prices aren't dropping. Interest rates are dropping. Houses aren't dropping. Interest rates are dropping. Firms is not dropping. You just get three-year financing free because the businesses have not come to reality yet because their stock market's so high. The businesses haven't come to reality yet because everyone's borrowing for free. And so they feel like inventory is low. Oh, by the way, inventory is low. So they feel like demand is high, but demand's not high, guys. Inventory is low. There's such a small number of cars being made because of the pandemic. There's such a small number of houses being made because of the pandemic and because People are not selling. So supply in every aspect, guys, every commodity is so low. It's not demand high, it's supply low. So we have artificial inflation. But again, in 2009, we didn't have any artificial inflation. We had deflation. And you're buying two coffees for the price of one. And you're getting, you know, buy one car, get one free. I felt like it was like Oprah back then. You get a car and you get a car. And people are giving $6,000 rebates. And then in the housing market, Scott, yes, President Obama, offered $7,500 tax credits and $8,000 tax credits, and that stimulated buyers. Rates are so low right now, and buyers are still not doing something. Rates are still lower. And when I say buyers, guys, I'm not just talking about housing market. I'm talking about everything, vacations. Guys, rates are at all-time low where you should put money on a, I'm not saying you should, I'm sorry. You can put money on a credit card and take a vacation, but we're not doing it. That's the one thing you shouldn't be doing. So here's the thing, guys. As we kind of like continue unpacking this gift, plugging it in, setting it up, reading the instruction manual, what does this all mean to play the game, to unpack the book, to set up the, you know, whatever technology contraption you buy. I don't like technology, but I'm sure some of y'all do. The new iPhone 12 Pro Max XL Blar, because I feel like everything I'm talking about right now probably feels like that to you, some of you guys. Hopefully not, because, you know, you're really smart. I just hope I'm delivering it the right way and unpacking the right way. We had a recession that no one knows about because the emotion blocked it from leading to stagnation. Another double, the double recession is coming, which is going to hit everyone with a ton of bricks because no one will have seen it coming. But God, it's right in front of us. Some of you say it's going to be this quarter and then the first, because it needs to be two quarters. Some of you say the first and then the second. 
but sometime in the winter, spring, or early summer, all we're going to be talking about is the double recession. All we're going to be talking about is how the stock market went from 30,000 to 20,000. All we're going to be talking about is how the housing market is plummeting because demand didn't really change. If anything, supply just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. So what does double recession mean for you and your own family? Well, the old, the old question that I keep putting out there, more and more of you guys are using, I do agree with. If you're looking to sell real estate in the next five years, you sell now. What about stocks? Same way. Gold, same way. Silver, same way. I mean, you sell anything right now, guys. Like there's nothing you should hold unless it's an emotional attachment for you and your family. Like I'm not going to sell my house because, you know, we're not moving in the next five years. But you better believe my money's in cash if it's not pre-tax dollars. My money's being pumped into y'all. My money's being pumped into my kids' education. My money's being pumped into the community, into the church, into our business, into people. My money, I'm not betting on gold. I'm not betting on houses. I'm not betting on stocks. How do you bet on stocks right now, guys? Everything we're talking about, we're talking about artificial inflation. We're talking about a recession and a double recession. If you knew that we're in between two recessions, what are stocks? What, what are stocks? Stocks are, you know, when stocks are high, it means that companies have high earnings. But you guys are all saying that we're about to hit a second recession. That means that earnings can't keep going up. So you guys are like, you know, the, you know the, the, the truth. You know what's coming before it comes. Guys, here's the thing. Scott is one of those invaluable reporters that actually gets on this call to, to hear and unpack everything that's out there. He doesn't go on other media sites to read what's going to happen. He is telling the, the story, right? And he'll unpack this and maybe he'll take some of it. Maybe he doesn't. You know, yeah, options, put options, absolutely. Short stock, absolutely. Glenn, should you sell your Nolan Ryan rookie baseball card? Absolutely. I know you put privately there, but man, I'm, it's actually a great question. Brad, Brad's selling stocks right now, or cards right now. I'm selling stocks. Cindy sold stocks. Catherine sold houses. Let's just put this out there, guys. We had a recession. No one heard about it. Think about that. What does that mean? It means that Scott's one of the few that are going to tell you how it is in real time. And, and to be fair, to be fair, guys, we had some really pressing issues this year that were more important than money, okay? Much more important. We have an uh, international we have issue, a pandemic. That's what it means. Like, it's worldwide that is killing millions of people, almost 300,000 in the United States. That's not political, guys. That is true. You know, um, that is real. So that is a top priority. We had a presidential election that only happens one every four years. And it's a leader of the free world. So the whole world's watching. So two of the biggest stories of the last four years happened this year. Oh, and by the way, we've never had more racial divide. We've never had more uh, a lack of confidence in everyone from law enforcement to security. Guys, what are the four things everyone needs? Everyone needs love. Hope you all feel love every day from your community, from your own household, from each of us. Everyone needs security. Guys, people don't feel secure. They don't feel secure from a lot of people in law enforcement and they don't feel secure. I'm just, I'm just I gotta put it all out there so you can see all of it because people don't lead on logic, they lead on emotions. So you need to see what people are feeling and what you're probably feeling yourself. You need to slow down to be mindful. People want security and they don't have it. They don't have security because even if they're smart and safe, maybe other people are not smart and safe. They don't have security because they're like, okay, my good friend is the best police officer I've ever met. And he's my godfather of my kids. Um, but that other police officer was not a good person. There's good people, there's bad people. And so they don't feel safe everywhere. And they don't feel safe for their own loved ones. But maybe they do, but they don't feel safe for other ones' loved ones. So they don't leave their house, guys. And they don't leave their house, which means they don't sell their house. They don't leave their house, which means they don't buy commodities. They don't leave their house, so they don't purchase. And they keep their money under their mattress. They don't put it in the bank. They don't put it in money markets because there's no rate there. So what happens when you have... A double recession. And why are we not talking about the first recession? Well, we're not talking about the first recession. There's too many other issues happening here, like we talked about. But what happens after the second recession? Guys, after the second recession, during and after it, because once we have another negative quarter GDP, you better believe we're going to hear about it. Either the fourth quarter, the second quarter, or the, excuse me, either the fourth quarter or the first quarter, you're going to hear about the negative GDP. And once you hear about one quarter, we'll be talking about the second quarter because everything else is already talked about. We can't talk about the presidential election anymore because the inauguration is about to happen. 
We don't need to talk about vaccines much anymore because they're coming down the pike. So two big concerns have happened. Hopefully we can just remove all this racial divide that hopefully I, I, that happens with each of you guys. That's one person at a time in your own communities, just showing love and grace across the aisle. So what does that leave? That leaves the economy. So once we have one quarter of negative GDP coming up, either the fourth or the first, we'll talk about the second. And once the second happens, it's all eyes on, guys. But once the first one happens, everyone's selling stock. Once the first one happens, everyone's selling their house. Once the first one happens, people stop buying cars even more so than now, stop vacation even more so than now, start saving more so than now. But the challenge is there's no incentive to save. Rates at all-time low, so we need to have incentive. The challenge is interest rates are so low, there's no incentive to put money in the money market. So the economy is going to force money into the money market. The economy is going to force money into savings. The economy is going to force the rate to go up. What does that do for the treasury rate? When they raise the rate, that means it's even more expensive to buy. When the mortgage rate goes up, it means it's even more expensive to buy a house. You see how now it becomes harder and harder to buy the house. Less and less people can afford to buy the house and more and more people are concerned, so they're saving. So it all kind of comes together. Um, a few questions, I wanna answer a few questions here. Avi said, selling stocks and keeping all in cash is risky too, since money's not worth much because they're just printing more. Generally mutual funds kind of stocks go up in the long term. no? Absolutely, Avi. So what I'll be saying is in the short run, if your money's been in cash for the last year, it's gone down 12%, absolutely. If you keep money in cash for too long, the, the value of the dollar goes down. But you can buy euros, you, know, you can buy pesos. I mean, you could buy gold, but I think that's gonna go down too. So the challenge obviously is that everything is going down. So yes, mutual funds are a safer investment. ETFs are probably pretty safe. Here's my point, that, Avi, that was a great segue. A little bit of what I said before, and I'll tie a bow around it on the back end is, why is everyone in the stock market? Everyone's in the stock market because they can't make money anywhere else. To Avi's point, if your money's in cash, you're losing money because the dollar is going down. If your money's in, in gold, it's really expensive and it's starting to go down. The same with silver. If your money's in real estate, if you can afford to buy, um, you can't do anything with it, it's not liquid. And so people want to put the money in savings. They want a 1% rate, they're not getting it. They're getting like 0.00. The other day I asked my banker, less for me, but more for my clients. I said, how much money do you have to put into a money market to get a 1% return? Do you know that with $200,000 in a money market right now, you get 0.47 and that's a good return? So people aren't put, moving money to a money market. Because I have clients that say, should I sell and put all my money into the next house? Or should I put it into stock? Where's my money? I'm like, well, how much you have? He said, well, I'm going to get about 400,000. Okay, put 200,000 down in the next house, put 200,000 down in money market. Wait, 200,000 times 0.47%, that's nothing. Okay, I'll put it in the stock market. Stock market just keeps going up. I'll just put it in the stock market. See what people are doing, guys? To Avi's point, you put it in cash, it goes down. You put it in the stock market, it looks like it's going to keep going up forever, but it's not. So Avi, here's the thing. The dollar will come back. The dollar will, the dollar will come back. Um, it's just going... To it's just going to take the second recession. So to, to Avi's point, what happens in a recession? You get stagnation. What happens in, an, in a recession? And actually, I love that you put that question when you did, because it's a great segue to the next part of this conversation is, guys, I said the bad news is we had a recession and we have a second one coming in a double recession over 12 months. The good news is, where do you put your dollars in a recession? The answer is yes. You buy commodities at a discount. The answer is yes. You buy stocks at a discount. Glenn, the answer is yes. No one else can afford your Nolan Ryan rookie cards. You sell now and you buy it back in a discount. Do you know that the most successful people buy and sell the same things over and over again? Like if you have a pair of Jordans right now that are worth $600 and six months from now after the double recession hits, it's worth $150 because people stop spending money, right? People stop buying unnecessary goods. They stop buying luxury items. If you have a luxury used vehicle right now, you sell it. If you have, um, a, you have a luxury, like if you have jewelry, earmuffs, ladies, if you have jewelry and you don't want it for long haul, you sell it. You know, now, now for the men out there, what you should do, Glenn, when you propose is 
you sell the jewelry that is not as valuable to you sentimentally or to your better half sentimentally, you put that money in cash, you hold tight, you let the, you let the double recession hit, and then you buy jewelry at a discount because there's so much markups in everything, guys. And so when the double recession hits, what happens to demand? The best place to be, Avi, in a recession is cash. Because while in the short run, it's going down because we're printing money, and this is worth not much less than the US dollar right now, when the market collapses, guys, when you hit your double recession, in 2009, if you had half a million dollars to buy a house, you were buying million dollar homes. If you had $30,000, you were buying brand new Mercedes. You were doing whatever you wanted. Guys, you know here the expression cash is king? Right now, cash isn't king. You can win a bidding war with, and I know I'm biased, but Teresa and the gang at CFM, they're winning bidding wars all the time because rates are in the twos and you don't need cash because you know what the irony is? The irony is cash is uncertainty, cash is power, and cash is power in a recession. Right now, there's nowhere to put your cash. There's nowhere to put your cash. Um, and so you might as well just, and, and money's free. So don't, bar, don't use your cash, right? And because people have so much false demand, there's no point of using cash for a house because, because you can get rates that are 2.5%. You, you take your write-offs, you're at 1.5%, and people just keep going higher and higher, and so your cash doesn't benefit you. But in a recession, in a double recession, in a depression, which may happen from two recessions, cash becomes king because what happens is, you know, Glenn, you made that private, but I had to make it public because it's so true. There's a reason Brad's selling his cards right now because the owner said cards are too high. You know why cards are too high, guys? Because they don't know where else to put their money. You know why stocks are too high, guys? Because they don't know where else to put their money. You know why real estate's so high right now, guys? Because they don't have anywhere else to put their money and they have nowhere else to go. They can't go on vacation. They can't go to the club. They can't go to the YMCA. They can't go to the JCC. They can't go to school. They can't go to, they can't go anywhere. They can't put their money anywhere. So they renovate their house. They put in the pool. They buy the bigger house. When the recession hits and is not followed up by a pandemic, like the first one this year, guys, the double recession is going to lead us into stagnation, probably deflation, and cash is king. Cash is an amazing place to be for everything from stocks to real estate, from everything from gold to silver to baseball cards, Glenn and Brad. I mean, it really is a case. People are buying anything they can right now because it's emotional. And, and it's just like with eating and drinking, like it's another, it just, it releases endorphins. People are spending right now, not because they need it, not even because they want it, it's because anxiety has never been this high. So you might be thinking, this is an economic talk, and David keeps going back into emotions. And But guys, people don't buy on logic. They never have. They never will. You know, Warren Buffett loves to say we love to buy high and, and or excuse me, yeah, we love to buy high and sell low. You know why? We wait for everyone else to say it's cool to do it. It's not cool to sell stocks right now. It's not cool to keep your used car. It's not cool to to sell your house right now. It's not cool to, to sell anything right now, right? Because what we should do right now is just hoard. We should just hold and, and just eat a lot and consume a lot and just bring it all in. We don't want to sell anything. We need that for comfort. We need that security. We need that for worth because our business is going under and we lost our job and our marriage is suffering and our relationships are suffering and we can't see people and, and we, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we have to touch things, guys. We got to touch new phones. We got to touch new things. We need to drink more, consume more. Everything's just consumption based. But guys, what happens when you have no money to do that? What happens when rates can't get any lower to do that? What happens when more and more people can't afford to do that? Because things don't happen overnight. So when the second recession hits, you want the bad news or the good news? The bad news is people that made decisions today before the double recession are going to have a bunch of cash on the sidelines. I'm telling you, don't buy a house right now. I'm telling you right now, if you buy a house, you or your clients are buying a house because of the pride of home ownership. You and your clients are buying the house because your family needs it. You and your clients are buying a house for the long haul or as a rental property, Leslie, because you know that more and more people are going to pull their money out of real estate and go and rent. And so rental rates are going to go up. 
So it's actually a great time. Investors are starting to come out of the woodworks. So if you buy a house right now, guys, you're doing it because it's good for you and your family, like in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Real estate was never a financial instrument. It is a blessing and a gift, but that's not what it was designed to do. It was designed to create memories and be a safe haven for you and your family, which is where I think it is kind of today. The challenge is people can't afford the houses they live in. The challenge is people can't afford to keep paying higher and higher home prices when no one's getting raises and people are being laid off, right? Like they're going in different directions. So don't buy a house right now. Don't let your clients buy a house right now unless it's for them and their family and future. Now, if you're going to sell in the next five years, your house better be on the market this Friday. You better be marketing your house by next Friday. You should not keep your house if you're planning on moving the next five years. Absolutely not. You might be thinking, wait, I shouldn't buy a house right now? You should buy a house right now, guys, if you do it for the right reasons. Don't let your clients buy a house for 500 unless you tell them it'll probably go down 10% the next year. And then if they say, well, that's okay because I want to make mem memories here. I need a bigger house. We're having a third child. I need a bigger house. My kids are doing homeschooling. I need a bigger house. My, my, you know, my office is at home now. I need a bigger house. I've got a dog. And so that's the reason, absolutely, get a rate in the twos. That's amazing. Don't buy a house for a financial instrument unless it's a rental property. Buy the house for the emotional instrument of creating memories and a safe haven for you and your family. Sell your house, sell your gold, sell your silver, sell your Nolan Ryan rookie card, sell your Herbert spread. That's a, a quarterback for the Chargers card for anyone who doesn't collect cards. Sell, sell your Jordans, Daryl. I might too. I'm, you know, or keep them for the long haul. Everything you own, because everything's going to burn, guys. At the end of the day, you can't take it with you when you go, right? If you're not going to own it in six years, sell it today. Everything. The double recession is coming. Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm going off my rule book of like just asking a lot of questions because there's a lot of y'all on here. I'm going off my, my, my own, my own um, rule book and getting on the soapbox, and I'm telling more, and I'm asking less. Also, because I, I want to tie a bow around this and be respectful of your time. But um, there's another private one. I'm not going to say who said it because it's private, but I'm going to read it because I like it. Um, before we go, can you explain putting pre-tax dollars in stock market and pulling out post-tax dollars? Visitors texting me to ask. Great question, guys. So here's the thing. Roth IRAs and regular IRAs. 401ks. And, you know, we have 401k, guys. If you're a W-2 employee with DHE, you have a 401k. Or once you've had six months with W-2, you have 401k. You know, I, I really believe in that. 401k. SEP, self-employment plan, anyone who's in real estate or mortgage on this call, anyone who has a, their own business, Scott, you, you've, you, you're, you have real estate, but you also own Charlotte Stories, you know, you, you own Charlotte, you own mul multiple media outlets, many of you own multiple businesses, Megan has a property management company on top of the real estate, many of you guys, Avi's husband invents like every other um, invention in the United States right now, like you guys all have multiple businesses, you should have a self-employment plan, um, depending on your income, you should have a Roth IRA. If it's too high, there's other more traditional IRA. Um, you know, if, if you're with our gang, um, you might have a 401k. You know, you might have a, a SEP if you have an LLC or an S Corp. So the answer to the question is you put as many of your dollars that you receive into investment accounts that hold off your taxes. So you don't have to pay them right now. So you make $3,000. And you put 500 into a Roth IRA, into a SEP, into an IRA, traditional or a 401k. Now you're only paying taxes on 2,500, and you might pay taxes in 30 years from now, 40 years from now, for the you know the youngins like like Shannon and Allison and others on this call. But for some of us older folks, right, Glenn, you and me, that we're starting to get closer and closer to to the the retirement age. I'm I'm thinking I you know um. I, I need to put more and more money in pre-tax dollars. I'm not worried about paying taxes on the back end. If I'm paying taxes on the back end, guys, that means it grew big, right? So the answer to the question, Shannon, is if you're investing in the stock market right now, it's because you're putting pre-tax dollars, meaning you made $10,000 and you put two into a retirement account and you're only paying taxes on eight. And so now you just saved 20, 30%. And so even if the stock market goes down 15%, if you're saving 20% on your taxes, you're still making a benefit. Does that make sense? But if you have your money in post-tax dollars that you pay taxes on already, like Cindy's money, she pulled it out and now she's like, this is great. I have my money in cash. When the economy crashes, cash is king. Does that make sense? So guys, to tie a bow around this, we had a recession the first 
six months of this year, we're probably gonna have another one in the next six to nine plus months. My two biggest questions for you are, what does a double recession mean for the economy, for the housing market and everything in between? And if you didn't know about the last recession, how can we be the experts to make sure that our own families and our clients know about the next um, before we're told about it? Um, I want to be respectful of time. I hope this has been helpful. You know, I know most of you, so we can talk offline, send questions. And then Scott has said, what is your best guess on how long the next recession will last? Great question. So I'll tie a ball around this conversation with this great question. Oh, Scott, that was awesome. It's almost like you're in the media. You know how to like, you're in marketing. You're like, like, Dave, Dave, you can't leave on that. You know, like, so, so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta like, you know, show me how to use this. Like, so the second recession, the double recession, how long is it gonna last? What does that really mean? Well, the more that people expect the recession, the shorter it lasts. If people don't see it coming, it takes longer because people aren't prepared. Um, you know, the first recession came and went really fast, right? Like it, it's already over, um, but that was fake. The pandemic made that fake. This one will last longer. Traditionally, it lasts 10 to 18 months. Uh, the, the, good news, the good news is, as bad as the pandemic is, the two things that came from the pandemic that I think that are positives in a horrible situation, one, people appreciate loved ones and relationships more, like something we've been preaching for years and years. Um, and two, people are a little more conservative now. Uh, and so I think the next one will be on the shorter end. Um, and and, and, and the, the third thing is, Scott, and for everyone, guys, is part of this recession had to happen, and it already did. The second part of this recession is a combination of the first recession not landing as heavy as it should because the distraction was on the pandemic and the racial divide in the presidential election, right? And, but but the, second, the other part is the second recession is because the first one ended too soon and because um, the pandemic. So there's a lot of jobs lost. There's a lot of business shut down. There's a lot of uncertainty. And so I don't think it's going to last as long as like 2009 because the economy is stronger overall. It just isn't as, stronger, as strong as it seems, if that makes sense. So we'll have a good 10 to 12 months, I think. So let's say it's the fourth quarter and the first. Sometime or in the first quarter, we'll talk, the, the media will really talk about it. Scott will talk about it tomorrow, which is why he's the best. But the media will talk about sometime in the first quarter. You see what I did there, Scott? But um, the media will talk about some time in the first quarter about how we had a fourth quarter GDP drop. And if Brad is right, it's the first quarter. So regardless if it's the fourth quarter and the first or the first quarter and the second, you'll hear about it after that quarter, right? So if it's a fourth quarter, you'll hear about it in the first. If it's the first quarter, you'll hear about it in the second. And they'll talk about a potential second recession, double recession. And then people are going to sell everything. Does that make sense? So I'm just telling you guys now to sell everything. Not to close on your back, but to close in your cart that you were going to buy that you don't need. Not the car in your garage, but the car in your cart that you're going to order. So if you don't need it, sell it. Focus on your loved ones, focus on your clients, and focus on the community where, you know, with Best Christmas Ever, we're, meet, we're seeing so many families that are in real needs. So we can't buy what we don't need when there's people that don't have what they do need. So just to close, Crystal said, who can we seek counsel from for specific financial guidance on where and how much to invest based on our income and goals? Crystal, send me a note. Um, I've got a couple of really trusted financial advisors that I've known for decades that are dear friends that don't tell me what I need to hear. They tell me don't buy stocks. They tell me keep your money in cash. See, anything I'm sharing with you is from my economist experience, but more so it's from other economists that I read about. And it's from variables that I'm watching, guys. It's from looking back in history and not keeping my head in the sand to say history won't repeat itself, but recognizing that it always does. You know how like, you know, you, you, know, you, you lost weight and, and then you got off the, you know, you got off the horse and, and, and started eating bad again. And then you put it back on. You're like, oh, I can't believe this happened to me. Why? Of course you can. It happens every year, like every two years, you know, everything repeats itself. And so I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. I'm just unpacking all the junk so you can see what's really right in front of all of us. The fact that none of us saw that there was a recession this year should show us how easy a second recession can come 
but we're in the middle of it, guys. The first recession's gone, the second recession's coming. What can we tell our family? What can we tell our kids? What can we tell our friends? And what can we tell our community? And what decisions can we make? And what decisions should everyone that we love make before it's too late? Um, I hope this is helpful. I appreciate you guys giving me so much time. I kept it right to exactly an hour and a half. We started five minutes over, um, but I hope it was helpful. I believe it was definitely recorded. So if you have any loved ones that need to hear it, please send it to them. Please reach out um, with any other questions. I, I know almost all of you and I love you guys and I'm here for you. Reach out, big or small guys, with concerns. If you're in a good place financially and you want us to make the best decisions, if you're in a bad place financially and you need help, just reach out. But I hope it's helpful, okay? Have a wonderful day and I learned how to use text. So I'm, I'm only a text away. Appreciate you guys. Talk to you soon.